Hello, everyone, and welcome to the American Pharmacists Association podcast series on what's new with the flu for the 2022 and 2023 season. This three-part series is supported by an unrestricted educational grant from VaxServe. I'm Michael Hogue, and I'll be your host for this series of podcasts on the latest updates on influenza vaccine. My background as the Dean and Professor of Pharmacy Practice at uh, the Loma Linda University School of Pharmacy and Professor of Preventive Medicine at the Loma Linda University School of Medicine. I'm also the APHA Liaison Representative to the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Now today's series is going to, episode is gonna focus on uh, understanding the different types of influenza vaccines that are available in the marketplace and thinking about how to select the appropriate age-based uh, vaccine particularly as we think about our populations who are 50 and over and who may have more risk. I'm really pleased today to have with us a true expert in the field of vaccinations, Dr. Carrie Konigsfeld, professor of pharmacy practice at Drake University in Iowa. She's gonna help us answer some of these questions and get through the complexity of all of these vaccines. Carrie, how about introducing yourself to the audience and giving people just a little bit of your background? Well, good morning, Michael. It's always fun to do a podcast with uh, the true expert, Dr. Hogue. So I'm at Carrie Konigsfeld. I'm faculty at Drake in Des Moines, Iowa, and I've been involved in vaccines for a long time with the American Pharmacists Association. I've had the pleasure of serving on their advisory board and delivering uh, their training program across the country. And it is definitely my most favorite thing really to teach. And it really is kind of twofold. Uh, one is because no matter what area of practice, a pharmacy you are working in, you are seeing patients that could benefit from the world of vaccines. The other side probably brings out my maybe nerdy pharmacist side in the sense that I like to learn new things and vaccines is ever changing. Yeah, that's really true. Speaking of ever changing, I can remember back in the mid to late 90s, there were only two flu vaccine products on the market. It was really easy for healthcare professionals to pick a flu vaccine because you just had a couple options and whatever was in your refrigerator is what you went with. But things have gotten a lot more complex. Now, Carrie, there are lots of different vaccine products. We've got standard dose products. We've got differentiated products, the way they're manufactured is different, some of their production processes. It, it is, it seems like it's a lot and, and it's hard to, you know, kind of make sense of all of it. Can, can you kind of uh, parse out for us all of these standard dose vaccines and these differentiated vaccines and help us see the big picture of what we're really looking at? Yeah, definitely. So the CDC has an awesome table that's out there. It's called CDC Flu Guidelines, and it's available for 2022-2023. And, you know, step one, of course, is just like you outlined, Michael, that we look at egg-based or a cell culture or a combinant-based type vaccination. But then as we look at these, you know, if we start with the standard dose, really starting with uh, what, what age are they approved for? And the overwhelming majority of those standard dose uh, are approved for six months of age and, and older. So that is really step one. Uh, then as you move into thinking about the cell culture based, um, which also is approved for six months and older, the high dose, uh, which is our over 65, our adjuvant approved for over 65, and then our recombinant, which actually does drop down into that over 18, but we'll be talking about the recommendations on the 65 an older population for that. But it's FDA approval is actually 18 and older on that recombinant vaccination. And then lastly, we have, you know, the LAIV for quadrivalent egg-based uh, intranasally administered vaccination. And that one's a little more special in the age indication where it is approved for two to 49 years of age and is our only uh, live influenza vaccination on the market. So really looking at how are they made, What's kind of their makeup and then what's their age indication would probably be how I'd, I'd approach it. Okay, so lots of differences that are there. Now, this year, the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices made some pretty substantial changes to their recommendations for uh, flu vaccine in people over 50. So maybe you could tell us about those changes and, and what are the options that pharmacists have to choose from uh, as they think about immunizing their patients this season? 
Yeah, they did come out with some specific recommendations as we look at patients over age 65, for sure. Um, They gave a little bit of a a preferential recommendation as far as looking at the high-dose flu or the recombinant flu or the adjuvanted flu as being ones that they felt like would give the best benefit for that patient population. But but you mentioned, Michael, something about age 50 and older. And I do think that's a population that we look at as having accentuated risk, per se. I look at that we are all getting older. And when we hit that 50 mark, we do sometimes see increase in medical conditions and increase in risk. And um, that that definitely can be a factor then in their ability to even fight off the flu, how severe that might be, hospitalizations and such. Those are all things that we're thinking about. So ACIP's recommendation, just to be clear, is specific to people 65 years of age and older uh, that we're supposed to preferentially be giving one of these three uh, differentiated flu vaccines that you described. And if I remember right, you said high dose flu vaccine or an adjuvanted flu vaccine or a recombinant flu vaccine. And, And was there any preference between or among those three vaccines that the CDC offered or did they just say any one of those three? They actually just kind of said any one of those three. There's not really head-to-heads with those three vaccinations. Um, We certainly have data on effectiveness, not only from the hospitalization side, but also on the tighter side with those vaccines. And interesting to note, there's really probably more data on the trivalent side than there is on the quadrivalent side. But we all know for this upcoming season, as well as last season, we were looking at everything on the market being that that quadrivalent uh, vaccination type. So what's the difference really between a standard dose flu vaccine and a high dose flu vaccine? Uh, is the dose substantially higher? Is there is there a lot of difference here? Um, clearly, there must be enough dis- difference that it compelled the CDC to change this recommendation. Maybe you could just give us a little bit more about what the differentiation is between these. Maybe we'll start with standard is a good place to start. So we're looking at the 15 micrograms of hemagglutinin in that standard dose. And then when we talk about high dose, it's actually four times that. So wow. it goes up to 60. Yeah. And, and then the recombinant is 45. So it is more potent. Um, and that likely also played into those higher, tighter levels that we saw in that patient population. And again, recognizing the significant risk that that group has, um, that is an important piece of the puzzle that we want to want to be looking at. Yeah, and we know the vast majority of hospitalizations uh, for influenza occur in those who are older, um, those who are 65 and older in particular, who have multiple chronic underlying conditions. And that happens to also be the population that historically has had the poorest response to flu vaccine. Uh, Their immune response is not great. And so this higher potency uh, seems to be making a difference. Uh, Carrie, uh, were there studies out there that supported this, or is this just a gut feeling that more is better? No, absolutely. I mean, the CDC does not do anything without looking at the data. I know uh, you you well know getting to serve on the ACIP and uh, attending their meetings that um, they are data driven group. And so there certainly is data that looks at, as I kind of alluded to earlier, looking at um, these three vaccinations that they've given preference to, um, to, to support not only those higher titer levels, but also looking at um, the effectiveness as far as reduction in risk of hospitalizations and overall reduction in, in incidents. And, you know, you mentioned that, you know, this group really it is one that we want to target. I know the CDC has some data looking at 2017-2018 um, data, which I know is dated, but, you know, these things take a little bit to pipe through the pipeline. And in that season, um, our 50 and older, like 50 to 64, 
war population was the second highest rate of flu with associated hospitalizations. And a third of that group they cited having additional medical conditions that put them at risk for complications. Um, but definitely data, um, definitely studies that are out there. And it'd be, it'd be a great uh, upcoming CE webinar uh, to look at all of that. Well, it's interesting because, you know, um, uh, pharmacists have been aware of these vaccines now for several uh, uh, years, uh, have been administering these vaccines. But, you know, the situation is that the CDC made this recommendation at the June ACIP meeting and pharmacies and hospitals and doctor's offices order their flu vaccine in January. So <clears throat> by the time the CDC made this recommendation for the 2022-2023 season, most pharmacies already had their vaccines supply set for what they were going to receive this year. Carrie, tell us what are pharmacists supposed to do if maybe they didn't order one of these three products? Um, you know, is there still an opportunity to be able to get those products in stock? And should they refer or defer patients um, to, to another provider if they can't give a person over 65 the, the uh, differentiated vaccine? Yes. Yeah, so that's a great question, Michael. And, you know, ultimately it's going to come down to what does their supplier still have in stock? So, I mean, they certainly at any point in time can look to ordering vaccine. We all recognize that there's only a certain amount of vaccine in the pipeline though. And so that may or may not be possible, noting that pharmacists do order their vaccine very early in, in the season. Um, it, the CDC has said, you know, if, if they do not have the high dose or the recombinant or that adjuvant vaccination that we should still get her done. Uh, we're still going to vaccinate. So you can still use a standard dose and that is going to offer protection and there should be no concerns with doing that. It's really a preference just on if one of those three is available, then we'd like to see one of those administered as a first choice. Yeah, so I think the bottom line here, it sounds to me like, is that pharmacies going forward are going to need to stock probably two flu vaccines at a minimum. They're going to need to at least keep a standard dose vaccine, which will allow them to vaccinate uh, uh, even children uh, down to as young as six months of age, depending on the state that the pharmacist lives in and what they're allowed to do from a practice standpoint. But then they're going to need to have one of these three differentiated vaccines uh, in stock for their people over 65 going forward. Would that be a correct assumption? Yes, absolutely. I mean, really, it's going to be planning moving forward. Uh, Realizing recommendations do change. And so, you know, what's going to happen in next season or the season after that? But I look that, you know, we should be prepared. And so it is important that they're planning now and they're going to have to order those, you know, well in advance. I mean, we know that that manufacturing process takes a while. And so we want to make sure that they're prepared and getting those orders in. Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, you know, one of the things I just want to bring up, Carrie, that we haven't talked about in depth is this population between age 50 and 64. <clears throat> you talked about the risk that people over age 50 have, um, uh, high risk conditions, higher rates of diabetes and hypertension and, and heart disease and other things that we start to see manifest themselves at age 50 and older. Um, and ACIP's recommendation for these differentiated vaccines is at age 65. Is there a scenario where it would be appropriate for a pharmacist to give one of the differentiated vaccines to someone between 50 and 64 years of age Recognizing that's outside of ACIP's recommendation, um, is it authorized to do that? Is it legal to do that? Can pharmacists do that? Or what are the considerations pharmacists have to take into account for that? Yeah, you know, it, there's lots of pieces of the puzzle. I mean, not only the FDA approval of the vaccine, but also the ACIP recommendation for the vaccination. And many states that pharmacists are in are utilizing those ACIP guidelines um, that drive their ability to either work under a protocol, you know, collaborative practice agreements and such. And so um, it's going to be important to know what each state allows um, and also recognizing 
something that um, that really could be going going off label, um, and so we might not have as much data. I know, you know, for example, uh, the CDC there is information uh, on that recombinant vaccination being administered to patients over age fifty. Um, you know, so in that fifty to sixty four zone, but obviously our recommendation um, is for that sixty five plus group. Yeah, and I think that's important for pharmacists to hear. So we've been under this pandemic declaration, emergency authorizations, and so forth that have come down from uh, from Department of Health and Human Services that authorize pharmacists in all states to administer flu vaccines. But that caveat is, is that says that it has to be according to ACIP recommendations. And so uh, the federal authorization that pharmacists have to immunize adults really uh, is tied directly to the ACIP recommendations and sticking with those recommendations. So you're right. I think that uh, pharmacists need to be very careful, um, you know, utilizing vaccines for off-label use or uh, for populations that the vaccine may not be FDA approved for, or if it is FDA approved, may not be recommended for by ACIP is something you got to really examine your state law. And we just want to encourage pharmacists to pay attention to that, be on top of what's uh, legal in their state as they move forward with vaccination. Yeah, and it's a great time to really just be reviewing those and recognizing as a pharmacist, as we practice over the years, these recommendations may change. And so I always tell people, you know, when that flu season's starting up, I mean, you really should be up to date all the time. But when flu season hits, you know you're going to be not only administering influenza vaccines, but other vaccinations. It's a great time to just take a little peek, review, make sure nothing's changed, um, you know, and pull pull those schedules and um, make sure you're just as up to date as possible. Yeah, so let's uh, say, you know, many of these things we're thinking about and talking about today uh, are clearly applicable to community-based pharmacies. And I'm sure our colleagues who are providing services to nursing homes and long-term care facilities see where this fits relatively well with them. Our hospital-based pharmacists, you know, they have an important role to play here too, Carrie. Uh, if, if you're the if you're the pharmacist in charge of inventory for a large health system, I'd say you've got an important role to play here. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. And, you know, as we think about our hospital pharmacists, obviously over the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen a heavy burden on the healthcare system. And so we really want to keep as many patients as we can healthy and out of the hospitals. And so the more patients that we can get vaccinated with the flu vaccination, uh, I think that is very important, not only from the community perspective, but also from the hospital. And I don't know if you've seen, Michael, but there's been a little bit of press on what's going on in the down under uh, zone of Australia. Um, Have you seen that, Michael? Yeah, I've seen that. And I think uh, that's a pretty good subject that we're going to devote the next episode of our podcast to is uh, talking about what's going on in the Southern Hemisphere. Well, Carrie, we've reached about the end of our time today. I want to thank VaxServe for sponsoring this podcast and making it possible for us to have this conversation. I want to thank you, Carrie, for being here, giving us this great information and being our subject matter expert today. And I want to thank you listeners for listening in. We hope that you found this useful. We thank you so much for what you do each and every day to care for your communities through vaccination. Now, tune in for two more episodes. As we said in the next episode, Episode, we're going to focus on Southern Hemisphere uh, uh, influenza activity and how that may or may not impact our flu season here in the U.S., as well as the co-administration of other vaccines together with flu vaccine. And then in our third episode, we're going to discuss how to have an effective, persuasive immunization consultation with your patients and how we can improve immunization rates. And that's all coming up in the third episode. Now, there is a list of references and resources available with this podcast in the APHA Learning Library. As always, we encourage you to go to pharmacist.com for the latest information uh, available about vaccines and flu vaccines in particular. There are many new events and activities coming from APHA, your source for vaccine information in the pharmacy world. Again, thanks everyone for joining us. For every pharmacist, for all of pharmacy, stay healthy and vaccinate all year round. Take care and have a great day.